But can I ask you a question? Uh, and perhaps there isn't any good answer to it. But let's say that she had not taken out that little sentence of the martyrs. Do you think they would have still gone after her? My question is, are they after her because she is because they're after everyone, that is, or is it something specific about that sentence, that situation? But, but also, as I understand it, it's a little bit more complex, because the, the charges against her is because of the poem and three posts on, on Facebook. So, so it's not only about the translation of the poem, am I right? Yes. Um. There was uh, uh, two more uh, status she she wrote on Facebook. Uh, one in one of them she quotes something from the news. It's not something she said. She just quote that uh, the Islamic Jihad uh, is calling uh, to Intifada inside uh, 48 inside Israel. And uh, the other uh, status is uh, is something not only her. It's a photo of some. Yes, it's a photo saying I'm the next uh, shahid, uh, the next martyr. But uh, um, it was all again mistranslated. Um, it's like I'm a, will I will be the next victim of uh, the Israeli occupation. This is what she meant. And it's not only her that published it, it was like many people put it there uh, instead of the proper pictures. If I can just follow up your questions, yeah. uh, because uh, what shall we call Israel a sort of uh, democratic tyranny or something like that? And it's a society like that, uh, of course, they are after everybody that are opposing. Uh, and they don't need very much excuses uh, to imprison them. I mean, I, I'm not working very much with the Israel-Palestine situation, but I'm working very much with Turkey. And in Turkey, which is the same situation, it's a sort of a democratic tyranny, uh, or, or uh, uh, authoritarian democracy, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and and uh, they just imprison whoever they think uh, they are afraid of. And they don't really need a lot of excuses to do that. And that's the situation for writers and journalists and uh, all over the world in these type of societies in Russia, in China, uh, Azerbaijan, and so on and so on. You know? So, of course, if she had done several things, they, they already are looking for her. And then they say, OK, here we have one word you can take her mm -hmm. and grab her and put her in, put her in prison. And that's it. And then she can sit there for, I don't know how long they can be in prison in Israel before they are. Long time. Yeah. <laughs> Before the trial is opened and... Uh, yes. and uh, mm. The trial is not finished yet. She is waiting for the final decision. Can I just add something? Because you said you were going to say something about theatre. There are some theatre people there. Because under oppression, I don't know if I'm right, and there are more people know more about history than me, but it seems to me that the theatre and also poetry gets a special sort of potential in times of oppression because the theatre is a place where you can sort of say something and mean the opposite and uh, the poetic language has also sort of potential of several ways of interpretation so you follow my thoughts uh, Pierre for instance you work very much with sort of documenting, discussing through factual things, uh, different situations. How do you look at poetry in relation to, um, to this, what we've just heard also from, from Finn's uh, material? I think it's <clears throat> a very interesting aspect of, uh, of resistance, of how it is possible to, to do resistance. And actually, in Norway, it, it was also perhaps not most poetry, but several other non-explicit ways of resisting, uh, with um, uh, multiplicity of interpretations. For instance, in totalitarian systems, in which I would include, to some extent, even though it's a semi-democracy, uh, Israel, 
the control of information is extremely tight and, uh, and the clamp down on everything that can possibly be interpreted as um, illegal resistance will be pursued. In such societies, uh, as it was the case in Norway under the Second World War, uh, it was very dif uh, difficult to express explicitly these resistances. So the case in Norway was uh, one where extremely creative, uh, wearing red caps, for instance, or um, in this, uh, paper clips, was like symbols of keep together, and. Uh, also very difficult for the, the totalitarian system to, to grasp. But they tried, and like the, I think they prohibited wearing red caps, even. Uh, so they make a fool of themselves in some way. And it's like a very complex discourse that arises from such uh, multiplicities of discourse, uh, of which poetry and uh, literature is uh, a significant uh, example, uh, much more available for assistance than would be um, long chronicles or, uh, or textbooks about the oppression, of which people also get worn out. We get tired of reading about wars and oppression. Uh, if you can, if you can, and that's also very much the case in Israel, I believe, the importance of reaching out to civil society and, and making alternative discourses. Um, that, of course, must be done in the mainstream media or uh, traditional media, but possibly it's much more powerful when done artistically, as, for instance, in poetry, literature, uh, theatre, and other, uh, other cultural expressions. And that's also why I'm slightly ambivalent to cultural boycotts, because I see, I see the potential, potentiality of reaching out uh, through culture. Can I give you <coughs> just a small anecdote from uh, Turkey? Because now it is forbidden to use t-shirts in Turkey where it says hero. Uh, last year, it was uh, on the market in Turkey. You had the uh, you could buy these uh, cool T-shirts of that hero, and uh, some uh, of the youngsters demonstrating outside the courthouse, they had this hero T-shirt, and then uh, the police interpreted the hero into Hocha uh, Efendim, uh, and I don't remember now just the R O what it was for, but, but it means sort of. Uh, Fetullah uh, Gulen, that is the Hocha, or the leader of our people, you know. So they thought, hero meant uh, secret message, Fetullah uh, Gulen, it says, that's what they interpreted. So they imprisoned these youngsters with a hero t-shirt, and now they forbid it to use a t-shirt with hero uh, all over. So this is the power of, uh, of symbols and, and uh, poetry, and also with poetry, if you are in prison. Of course, you can write the poetry in your hand. You know, you, can, you, have, you have little... Uh, possibility to have papers, and you can have some toilet papers, and you can write your poetry, and then you can keep up the resistance and keep up the idea of, I'm still, uh, I'm still writing, I'm still uh, resisting the authoritarian regime, I'm still doing my work, and you keep up your identity and your self-consciousness. So it's really, really important. So that's why also uh, poetry is so important in these situations, and, and why people write much poetry in situations like that. And it's easy to get through, you know, now through Facebook and YouTube and things like that. Before, through small books, small piece, piece of papers, and they can just be transported all over uh, secretly, you know. It's tougher with a novel on 500 pages, you know, to, to tell them that you have to resist. It's harder to get with, uh, the message through. And um, I think the, the, the power of poetry in these uh, situations is a double one. First, it is the poetic uh, reaching out from one human being to another human being, but also in the fact that, uh, um, in the sense that this type of expression provokes another type of uh, expression as a response from the government. And that type of expression 
is in itself so ridiculous that this poetry has a political function, not only by by telling about human suffering, but also in 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 um, undressing the the power uh, for being the kind of ridiculous power that it is. Uh, and one basic. One, one major difference between Turkey and Israel, seen from a Norwegian point of view, is that we as a state, we have our leaders saying we are very worried about the human rights situation in Turkey. We are very aware of it. We don't say the same thing about Israel. That is the main difference. And I think the power of poetry can, can uh, in the long run, uh, uh, expose the lack of democratic impulses uh, for being what they are. Um, because the control of artistic ex expressions is so difficult that it must be total, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So in Eastern Germany, after the war was built in 61, um, an Ibsen play was uh, uh, a doll's house was suddenly uh, prohibited. Why? Because it, Nora is leaving her husband. That could be interpreted as um, uh, as leaving East Germany, for example. <laughs> it is so. Uh, it is. You cannot stop. You have to control everything mm. if you want to control just one line in a poem. And in, in uh, as you said in in uh, in our application history. It was the paper clips, it was the red hats, but also uh, people like here in Oslo started uh, on the trams, not sitting down uh, beside uh, a Nazi officer, a German officer or a Norwegian Nazi. And so it was, uh, um, it became law in Norway. <laughs> if there is a spare seat, you have to sit down. <laughs> It's great, it ridicules the authority. Yeah. I know, um, uh, Anna, that you have been in uh, contact with Diane. Uh, very soon we're going to meet her uh, on the screen. She will be reading uh, the poem poetry herself. But what did the, what's her feeling about that some place very far away, some people are uh, trying to discuss her, <laughs> yes. her poem? And, uh, engaged in her case. I uh, texted Darin uh, an hour ago saying that uh, I'm going to speak in this panel and if maybe she wants to say something to the audience. So she wrote a few lines and I was trying to translate it to my broken English. Uh, so I'm sorry if uh, I must... Uh, Maybe it's not such a good translation. Um, so these are her words. The regime can imprison a poet body. It is terrible and a very difficult thing. But it cannot imprison his poems, feelings, words. And the proof for that is that the poem has passed all the restrictions that were put on it and reached you in Oslo while I'm under arrest for two years now. For that, I want to thank you all. So, if you have yeah, okay. And just um, uh, the word, uh, doom telephone. <laughs> has been uh, registered uh, by Norwegian language uh, people, but it is still not um, uh, accepted as a Norwegian word used by, by people working in the Norwegian state. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so uh, please do say hello to her if you have contact with her. Um, uh, at least on, on my uh, part. Should we now... Uh, Hear the poem in Arabic, yes. uh, read by Sarin uh, yes. Tatou herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. are we ready to show it, or yes. Yes. we yes. need to move that? Yeah, I yeah. Should, so I will okay. just I will thank you all. Finn, just another second for um, 
using uh, your Sunday uh, to come to take part in this discussion. It says something that for some people, the case of Darien Kapoor and uh, the struggle of the Palestinian people and the situation is uh, very important. So I thank you uh, uh, on their behalf, on my behalf, and uh, I think we had a quite nice conversation. So thank you for, uh, for trying. Um, yes. Thank you, Kai, for coming here. So this, uh, it's a link that Ava sent me this morning. So maybe it's the recording she posted on Facebook, right? With the video yes. she made. With her voice. With Darin's voice. Reading her, reading her poem. Yes. yes. I will just create this. Thank you. 